Good morning. I've, I've got to start off this morning by saying I've, I've grown up in the church. I've gone to church from before I can remember. And um, there have been times, and I think we all do this in different ways, where we're sitting and maybe there's not a whole lot going on and our mind wanders and we wonder, I wonder what it would be like to like climb Mount Hood or go skydiving and imagine kind of what that all might be like. And because I've grown up in the church, I've often wondered what it would be like to stand up in front of a bunch of people like this and deliver a message. And I'm going to find out. <laughs> I can remember as a kid thinking, well, you know, if I'm up there, I'm going to be wearing a suit and a tie and looking very pastorly. Well, <laughs> I didn't quite imagine a, a loud Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> Who says God doesn't have a sense of humor? <laughs> I'd like to speak this morning on a topic very dear to my heart. It's about the love of God the Father for us. An appropriate message for today. After all, today is Father's Day. Obviously, it's the day we focus on our fathers and recognize them for the influence they have had on our lives. Hopefully, we'll be spending a portion of the day today honoring our fathers who are still here and the fathers who have passed on. It's my goal today to take a look at our Heavenly Father and some of the new understandings I've been learning about his relationship to us and to me. So, let's start at the beginning. In the beginning, God. These are familiar words to perhaps all of us. He existed before creation, and he spoke it all into being. When he finished creation, he said it was good. And when he breathed life into Adam, he said it was very good. He then created Eve as a companion for Adam, and they had perfect, unhindered relationship with God and the beauty of the garden. Close your eyes for just a moment and try to imagine what that must have been like, to, work, to walk in a perfect creation in the peace of that beautiful garden with unhindered relationship with God. God only placed one restriction on Adam and Eve. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you will die. By giving them this restriction, he was providing them the freedom to choose to obey him or not. A freedom that he continues to extend to us today. Unfortunately, with the help of Satan in the form of a serpent... They chose not. Now, in my mind, and this may give you some insight in the way that my mind works sometimes, it can be scary, it would seem to me that the most efficient way for God to deal with this would have just to cut his losses, it was right at the beginning, just take them out and start over fresh with someone else. I mean, kind of like a cosmic whiteboard. Let's just, uh, that didn't start well. Let's, let's try it again. But he didn't. They had failed. God still loved them. There were serious consequences for their disobedience. Their life on earth from this point on would be difficult and they would eventually die. As he had warned them, and they would return to the dust from which God created them. They were removed from the garden where they had enjoyed that unhindered relationship with him. But God also provided clothing for them and promised them that one day a descendant would come who would redeem all that they had lost. That's how much he loved them. To accomplish this redemption, God shows a people, a nation through which this Redeemer would come. God started with Abraham in Genesis 12, but in Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, we see why God shows Abraham and his descendants to be his holy nation. You are a holy nation, 
The Lord you got, your God has set you apart for himself. He has chosen you to be his special treasure. He chose you out of all the nations on the face of the earth to be his people. The Lord chose you because he loved you very much. He didn't choose you because you had more people than any other nation. In fact, you had the smallest number of all. The Lord chose you because he loved you. So God didn't choose Israel because they were so impressive or powerful or influential. There was nothing special about them that moved God to choose them. They certainly were not perfect. They were chosen because God loved them. Beginning with Abraham down to this time, as Moses was preparing them to enter the promised land, he promised that they would become a powerful nation. God then provided them with all they needed to know to follow him and receive his blessing. He established a covenant of love and protection between him and them, and then provided them with everything they needed to know to uphold their end of the covenant through his commandments and the law. They did not earn God's love. In fact, Moses, as he was leading Israel into the promised land, described Israel as a stubborn people. And Moses should know. The history of Israel throughout the Old Testament is one of their rebellion, suffering the consequences, calling out to God in their bondage, and God's response by raising up men and women whose humble obedience and trust in God would overcome overwhelming odds to develop, to rather to deliver his people. These Heroes in the Old Testament were not perfect. The heroes God chose were often unlikely and insignificant. But that was no problem for God, who provided them with the strength they needed. And when they trusted in God's provision and acted in faith, they accomplished great things. They also failed when they chose to act out of their own selfish desires and pride. The story of Israel's relationship with God is one of periods of faithfulness when God delivered them, followed by periods of willful disobedience and decadence when they forgot all that God had done for them. There are always negative consequences for the disobedience, but God's love and care for them never wavered. God promised that there would come a time when he would provide a Messiah— his arrival was prophesied throughout the Old Testament, and Israel longingly anticipated his arrival. And that time finally arrived. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. And he arrived in a world that recognized and respected power and military might, magnificent displays of human accomplishments and architecture and pomp and circumstance. The world was a pagan, violent place. Israel was in bondage to Rome. They were seeking a Messiah that would deliver, <coughs> deliver them politically <coughs> and return them to their former glory. But the fullness of time was not the world's. It was God's. And his arrival, <coughs> excuse me, was contrary to God's wisdom. The only pomp and circumstance was a choir of angels announcing his arrival as a baby in a manger, in a stable, to shepherds watching their sheep. There's a contemporary song <coughs> written by Chris Rice that simply yet powerfully portrays the welcome he received from those who were there at his birth and speaks of our welcome to our world today. Sweet would have known, but long away. 
Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, arrived under the most unlikely circumstances, and the first proclamation of his arrival to our world in general was made by a group of exuberant shepherds to the amazement of the citizens of the small town of Bethlehem. And this was to characterize the nature of Jesus' life and ministry, reaching out to the ordinary people around him, and including the outcast, the unclean, the unwanted, with a healing touch and unconditional love. A love that was a part of his entire human life on this earth to the point that when he was dying on the cross, surrounded by those who had sought his death, who were shouting insults, spitting on him and ridiculing him, along with his weeping mother and just a few of his sorrowing disciples, he called out to God the Father, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I can remember in um, grade school, a Sunday school teacher telling the crucifixion story, and he looked at us and he said, you know how much Jesus and God loved you? This much. This much. Romans 5, 7 through 9 clearly states the extravagant love of God for us. <clears throat> Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's face it, God's love is really beyond our understanding. It's the only kind of love like this that we know. Regardless of how worthy or unworthy we feel, regardless of whether you have invited Christ into your heart at this point, he is, his love is faithful. It is deep. It is personal. And it's for everyone. And he rose again three days later as the final and complete sacrifice for our sins so that we might have life and have it more abundantly that we might be free from the bondage of sin and through his Holy Spirit in our lives have access to the throne of God. <clears throat> so, what does that mean to us today? I, I've often wondered how wonderful it would have been to have lived when Christ was on this earth and to have had the opportunity to see him and walk with him, experience his miracles and the love he had for those he met. 
I'm come, I can sometimes be a slow learner, but I am coming to the conclusion that the only main difference between now and then, besides a couple thousand years, is that we can no longer see and touch Jesus. And that is a big one. But if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit living in us as our connection to Christ the Son and God the Father. I have, in the process of preparing this message, discovered a link between two scriptures that reveal the true nature and power of this connection through the Holy Spirit. Just before his crucifixion, Jesus retreated with his disciples to pray, as he often did throughout his ministry. He took them to the Garden of Gethsemane and poured out his heart to God the Father. We find this in Mark 14, verses 32 through 36. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. And then going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba, Father. <coughs> Excuse me. Abba <coughs> is translated as a more informal, intimate, even childlike daddy. From the depths of his sorrow, Jesus addresses God in the most intimate terms. And yet he expresses his even deeper faith and trust in Abba by surrendering his will to God's. What an amazing picture of the wonderful, powerful God powerful bond between God the Father and Jesus the Son. I have even <clears throat> at times found myself a bit envious of that relationship because obviously I'm not Jesus. I'm not without sin. I'm not God's perfect child. I know that there are consequences for my bad decisions and failures. I have sometimes felt that I am the least deserving of God's children and have no expectation of God desiring to hear from me. But he does. We find Paul saying these words in Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. That little phrase, adoption to sonship, if you will, given the theme of the day, is kind of the big kahuna of adoption. <laughs> This is not kind of a sort of an adoption. It's an adoption that gives you all the rights and privileges of a true-born son or daughter. That's the kind of adoption we have through the Holy Spirit. And by him, by the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I don't need to be envious of Jesus' relationship with God because 
The gift of the Holy Spirit gives me the same relationship to God, the same intimate, deep relationship that Christ had. Jesus currently is not physically on earth, but we are. As Christians, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we are also brothers and sisters with Christ. And as such, filled with the Holy Spirit, we are the physical representations of Christ in our time. We are literally the body of Christ to those who are seeking and are lost. <laughs> I don't know about you, but to me that sounds pretty intimidating. We feel inadequate. How can I possibly be Christ to my world? I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm insignificant. I just, I just don't have what it takes. If you have said that to yourself, and I've certainly said that to myself, you're right. And it's true of all of us. But God, from the beginning of time, has taken the humble, imperfect, ordinary men and women just like us and invited them to participate with him in his mission to redeem his creation. And he invites us today to participate with him in reaching our world. Listen, it's okay that we're not perfect. We're not bringing the world to us. I often make that mistake. We are bringing the world to the Jesus whose spirit lives in us. To the Jesus who can fill us with his love and his hope and his truth and his freedom so that it just spills over onto those we meet. And the amazing thing is that when that happens, he gets the glory, not us. The focus is on him. So... How do we get to that point where our lives just splatter God's love on all those around us? First, reach out to him. Reach out to God. Spend time with him in prayer and know that he loves you and wants the best for you and wants to spend time with you. Even if you feel you're at your worst condition you've ever been in, God wants to speak to you and help you. Get into God's Word and learn more about Him and the people in the Bible just like you who chose God in the midst of their imperfections. Join a friends group and join the others who just like you are seeking to know God better and to know each other better. And so we can help each other in our struggles. And get involved in serving others. In our fellowship and in the community around us. And see how God will use you in simple but profound ways to touch the lives of those around you. God the Father has provided everything we need to have a vital, transforming relationship with him. He gives us the freedom to say no. He will not force himself on us, although he certainly could. But when we freely say yes to his gift of salvation and then in humble obedience daily say yes to his presence in our lives, we fulfill our part of his covenant with us. And we find our lives transformed by his loving partnership with us. And the light of his presence in our lives can bring to our world the hope and peace and salvation that only God through Christ can bring. In the process, we will bring the full power of God's love to our fellowship and to the lost and the needy in our community. Will you say yes right now? It's a good time to begin. If this is the first time, you may be saying it. Or if it's the thousandth time, God's not keeping count. 
God is faithful. And continue to say yes every day from this point forward and see what God will do. Our God is an awesome God. And he's a wonderful, loving father. There's a responsive saying that is fairly common in the church. I'd like to do that at this time. And if this is new to you, it's really easy. We'll say it a couple of times. God is good. And all the time, God is good. And all the time, Let's pray. Father, how can we ever, ever thank you enough for all that you have done for us and through us? For the way that you have shown your love to our world throughout the, the Bible, throughout history, in spite of the ways that we are often unfaithful to you, Lord, we're human, you know that. You've known that from the beginning. You've loved us from the beginning, and you will love us till the end of time. Help us, Father, to return that love to you by involving ourselves in your calling, in your effort to redeem your creation. You could do it all on your own if you wanted to, but Father, you have chosen to use us. What a privilege we have to work with you to be in partnership with the God of creation, to reach out to our broken, troubled, violent world. Lord, it's easy to become discouraged with a, the with a pandemic and all the political unrest and everything that's just going on throughout the world, Lord, but our world has been like that for a very, very long time but you still choose to reach out and to touch our hearts and involve yourself with us and help us to be who you created us to be, to be free from the bondage of the things this world has and to be free to worship you and know you and love you and call you our Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord. Help us to grasp the vision of what you want to do through us here, in this place, right now. And Father, help us to grasp that you want to do that through me. And for each of one of us to say, God wants to do that through me and help us to find our place where we can do that and find even greater blessing in serving you. Thank you, Father. Amen. Men, you guys who are dads, you carry the world on your shoulders. But you know what? You don't have to do it alone. We have an Abba Father that gives us strength and encouragement all along the way. And we got each other. Have a great day great Father's Day and a wonderful week, and we'll see you here next Sunday.